Many people think we don't know anything about the origin of life on Earth. There is a lot we don't know, but we do know a few things. For example, life originated on Earth about 4 billion years ago. About 400 years ago, this tree grew from a seed, a seed like this one. But 4 billion years ago, there were no seeds for life to grow from. Life had to come from non-life, but how? What kind of non-life? There are so many different kinds. There are rocks, and air, and water. What kind of non-life did life come from? How much do we know about the origin of life? How much do we know about the transition from non-life to life? Well, we know that the sun and the earth started out as an overdensity in a molecular cloud, and it was made out of a cold, odorless gas called molecular hydrogen, mostly, with some other contaminants at about the 1.4% level by mass. We know that this is a life form today. Life forms like this are made out of hawk and piss, hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur at about the 98% level. So the question we want to ask is, what are the prerequisites for this transition from a cold, odorless gas four billion years later to have a kangaroo, a complex multicellular eukaryote? Well, in between there, let's forget about eukaryotes for a second. We have to note where's the transition from here to here. This is still the transition we're interested in to a life form, a unicellular hypothermophile, probably, life form. We need water, we need CO2, and we need N, P, and S. Well, this took about three billion years of quiet time, but what about this transition here? This is the one we're most interested in. Well, to have this transition, you need a star, you need a rocky planet with water, you need a source of energy, and no nearby supernova to make everything go boom. But how many years does it take? This took three billion years about. How many years did that take? Well. To make a star, it takes about a million years. To make a rocky planet around that star, it's about a hundred million years. Life, how long does that take? A hundred million years? Ten million? I don't know. We don't know. That's something we don't know. So we can ask the question, when and where did life originate on Earth? So let's talk about when first. Now, here's some scenery that's supposed to be at the origin of life, and here's some stromatolites, some of the first life forms. Here's the time scale we're talking about. Here's now, here's a billion years ago, two billion. Here's the 4.5 billion year origin of Earth. That's how long the Earth has been here. How long has life been on Earth? Well, it's been, it's live, it's today, there's life. Back to here we have really good evidence and then maybe it was here, maybe not. We're gonna argue about this section here of how early was life on Earth. But it seems to be that life established itself on Earth quickly, as soon as it could have, because this is a long time. I mean, this is a very short interval here where life started, but it's important to know how, exactly how big that interval is. Now, at this time, about four billion years ago, the moon was 10 times closer. When the moon is 10 times closer, the tides are 1,000 times larger, which means that today's, I don't know, about one meter tides were one kilometer tides, gigantic tides. The moon was 10 times closer. So we have one kilometer tides. Not only that, the 24 hour day we have today used to be an eight hour day because the earth was spinning a lot faster. So instead of two one meter tides in a, in a 24 hour period, we, have, we had six one kilometer tides in a 24-hour period. That's, that's, that's uh, kind of rough. So there are no quiet little tide pools, but lots of wet, dry cycles because of six one-kilometer tides in a 24-hour period. Also, there's no oxygen, no ozone, and uh, lots of UV because ozone absorbs the UV. What about oxygen? Oxygen is important now. You can hear me breathing here. But here's today. Here's a billion years, two billion, three billion, 3.8 billion years ago. Here's how oxygen, here are our maximum estimates for the amount of oxygen and minimum amounts. And here's the current level right here. 
That's how much is in the, the air you're breathing now. The GOE, the Great Oxidation Event, happened about right here, about 2.5 billion years ago. And the earliest life, which we know existed here, about 100, well, 1.5 billion years without oxygen. So the earliest life forms are anaerobic. That we're very sure of. We, our ancestors, moved to land about right here, about 400 million years ago. So what about when? So we're going to talk about the history of the accretion of the bombardment, the oldest rocks, the oldest fossils, the oldest isotopic fossils, and the oldest and deepest parts of the phylogenetic tree. So we can, we can approach this question of when based on a lot of this different evidence, and we're going to present that evidence right now. First, history of accretion and bombardment of the Earth, because if you're buying, being bombarded, it's hard to, I don't know, it's hard to have the origin of life. Anyway. Here's the proto-Earth, and here was a giant moon-forming impact about 4.5 billion years ago, about 20 to 100 million years after the formation of the solar system. And for comparison, here's about the size of the impact 65 million years ago that wiped out the dinosaurs. Tiny little blip, gigantic, very important. So here's today, here's the Earth. This y-axis is the accretion rate, tons per million years. And so you can see the amount of material that was hitting the Earth in the first, I don't know, 100 million years or so was gigantic. This is when the, first, the moon forming impact occurred. And here's now, so here's, and here's like T0, so 1 billion years after the beginning, 2 billion, 3 billion. Here we are 4.5 billion years later. Now, so that T0 is 4.567 billion years ago. Here's 3.8 billion years ago. There's 4 billion years ago. And this is where the origin of life happened, probably. And here's the moon forming impact. The great oxygen event is right here, 2.3 or 4 million years, billion years ago. And so there's no oxygen here, there's oxygen here. And uh, I just wanted to point out that the, 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 the Earth is still being bombarded. There's still an accretion rate of about a million uh, tons per year, million tons per million years. <laughs> And in the past, look at this, um, there was a million, a billion, a, a quadrillion times the accretion rate that it is today. So it really was a lot of bombardment going on there. And it increases as you get back into the past. Now, the moon can act as a bombardometer. You see all these pock marks here? Those were impacts, and they didn't get washed away. They didn't get rained away. There was no plate tectonics to remove them. So the moon is a great bombardometer for the environment, what, how much the Earth was getting hit by bomb, by boom, 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 by things. So here, for example, is a plot, the age of the surface. So here's 3.1 billion year old surface, 3.3, 3.9, 4.1. This is how old the surface is on the moon. And here is the total number of craters greater than 20 kilometers. So you're, you're counting the number of craters inside of other craters. And here's the moon, the data we have, and here the estimates for the Earth are much higher. So did large impacts frustrate the origin of life very early on? Or were they needed for the origin of life? We know so little about the origin of life, maybe the impacts helped it. The Earth will likely suffer 10 impacts by objects more massive than any that strike the moon. So you take the biggest and oldest impacts on the moon and say, ha, the Earth was struck probably by 10 impacts that were larger than the largest that hit the moon. That's because the Earth is a bigger body and it can pull things in more. What about the oldest rocks on Earth? So here's a picture of the entire Earth. And the oldest rocks are from Ishua, Greenland, right here, and from the Pilbara, right here in Australia. Now, there are modern stromatolites in Shark Bay. Here they are. And if you do a cross-section, this is what it looks like. And uh, they're microbial mats, essentially. And here you can see that the green part is at the top where the sun comes. Now, the oldest macrofossils. Now, we're not talking about microfossils. We're talking about macrofossils, things you can see, things the size of your hand, are between 3.4 and 3.7 billion years old stromatolites. And so here are three papers. These people are working very hard to get this data. Here's a recent paper in 2016 by Nutman et al. The issue a crust, super crustal belt in Greenland. 3.70, the Dresser Formation, 3.48, and then 3.43. <coughs> Excuse me. So these are the oldest evidence for stromatolites. 
Now, what about the oldest microfossils? Now, that's going to be based on isotopes. These are microfossils. And there, it's older. It's 3.8 to 4.1 billion years old inside of zircons. This is a zircon. And then you have these little containers here, carbonate granules. And it's carbonate, so it's got carbon. And carbon has two isotopes, 12 and 13. Life prefers carbon-12 to carbon-13. Aha, so if life is around, you will see carbon-12 enriched. Therefore, organic carbon with a low 13 to 12 ratio can be evidence for life. And it's not the strongest evidence, but is the best evidence we have when you go back this far. So in 1996, Moiges et al. wrote a paper saying, hey, we're seeing carbon, we're seeing light carbon uh, 3.8 billion years ago. Evidence for life on Earth. And then Bell et al. in 2015 said, oh, well, we're seeing it at 4.1, even older. So this is hot, cop, hot topic, trying to find the lightest carbon and the earliest carbon. So, so with life preferring 12 to 13, we have a plot here. This is the high carb 13 to 12 ratio, and here's low 13 to 12. And Inorganic carbon is up here, organic carbon is here, and these are the hunters of low 13 to 12 ratios, and here are their results plotted here, and here is the Jack Hills, this study, Bell et al. 2015, which comes down at 4.1 billion years ago. And uh, maybe that's the best evidence we have for the earliest life. So we talked about when, how about where did life originate on Earth? Well. Here is a lovely picture of all life on Earth. Bacteria here, Luca started here, and here's Archaea, and you can see that the eukaryotes are now part of Archaea. Well, the last universal common ancestor is here, and the question is, what was that thing? Notice that Luca is not the origin of life. If here's bacteria and here's Archaea, Luca is right here. The origin of life is down here. There could be many things that branched off here and then went extinct, and so Luca is not the same thing as the origin of life. Carl Woese, great guy, 1928 to 2012. Here's a paper from 1977 in the New York Times front page of scientists making the front page of the New York Times. That's really good. And what he did was created, he used a 16S rRNA to make phylogenetic trees, things like this. And then what we did was turned it into a thermometer. And the things that were closest to the roots had the highest maximum temperature. And then the cooler ones, like the eukaryotes, were further away. And so the idea then is because life started out hypothermophilic, then became thermophilic, and then became mesophilic. Um, anyway, there are two models for the origin of life. One is at hydrothermal vents, and the other is at hot springs. These are underneath the ocean, and this is at the surface. This can be fresh water, and this will be salt water coming out of the vents. So let's look more carefully. Hydrothermal vents are all these red spots where the continents are being pulled apart. You know, so there's pulling apart and then they create lava, a little magma is coming up at these regions. And uh, what is a hydrothermal vent? It's essentially a spreading axis right here, hot reaction zone, 400 Celsius, 350, and then poop, presto, change you quickly go from to the, to the temperature at the bottom of the ocean from 350 to, then you, all of these things get taken out of solution and then they pile up around it. So for example, you have white smokers at a hydrothermal vent. They're anaerobic, there's not much oxygen. They fix CO2, they're dependent on molecular hydrogen, they fix N2, and they're thermophilic. This is the life forms down there. So white smoker hydrothermal vent chemistry, there's a paper in 2016, The Physiology and Habitat of the Last Universal Common Ancestor. So what they did, they analyzed the genes of in the phylogenetic tree and came up with the best guess of what Luca was doing and they made it consistent with the idea of a, of a hydrothermal vent chemistry. So what do you do? You start out with hydrogen, CO2, and H2S. That's the geochemistry you start out with, no life. And then you have some type of lipid layer that they've drawn in here, but there's a pH difference between this and the outside. Here's the ocean in gray, inside is here, this is the hydrothermal fluid. This has a pH of 9, this is a pH of 6, so there's a pH difference. That means there's a gradient for protons. So if you have a pump here, then you have protons coming in, 
This is a membrane transport protein right here embedded in the membrane and the, the pH gradient drives this here and then sodium is pumped out. When you pump out sodium there, you can then take advantage of sodium coming in over here. And that can make ADP turn it into ATP and that's the energy source. So we have a natural pH gradient pumping this, the sodium out and then recovering that energy to make ATP there. Notice that here the molecules, iron and nickel and molybdenum, sulfur, and carbon. So life on Earth could have started in places similar to the grand prismatic hot spring in Yellowstone National Park. So now we're shifting to away from hydrothermal vents to something that's at the surface. This is obviously at the surface. It's fresh water and not salt water. And this could be compared to uh, Darwin's warm little pond. And now we have UV radiation coming, particularly four billion years ago when there was no oxygen in the atmosphere. So here's a, a diagram of what that could look like. First you have synthesis here, you have accumulation concentration, here you have a cycle going on. And this is from a paper by uh, Damer and Norcus. So it's in, with fresh water, not salt water. Notice there's not, this is like a, a mountains and streams and, and little lakes uh, attached to each other and then going down into the river or the ocean. And it's, it's wet dry by evaporation, not by tides. So there are pools here that you know, get filled with water and then it rains and then it dries up and then leaves things and it's got a wet dry cycle from evaporation, not tides. And there's plenty of UV if you need UV to energize molecules. So there are two models for the origin of life. One is the hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the oceans at these red spots, for example. And then there's one at hot springs that are on the surface. Here we have salt water, no UV, no atmosphere. And over here we have fresh water, UV, and an atmosphere. One other thing that's important four billion years ago is the amount of, uh, the, the amount of radiogenic heat flux. So here's time, here's today, a billion years ago, two, three, four billion years ago. This is the amount of heat flux provided by these four isotopes. Potassium-40, uranium-235, uranium-238, and thorium-232. And notice that as over time, they go down, 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 and less and less. But uh, so if here's the total today. Well, the 20, the total back there was 80. So we have about four times as much more active surface. We have more hot springs and hydrothermal vents because of this radiogenic heating going on. We also have more accretion energy back then. So the origin of life, when was it? Well, it was before 3.5 billion years ago. Maybe 3.7, maybe 3.8, maybe 4.1, depending on how seriously you take this isotopic evidence. In any case, it was probably after the moon forming impact, which is about 4.5, maybe life occurred seven, several times, not just once. Where did it happen? Well, there are two models, hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the oceans or at the surface in hot springs, and here are those differences. Why isn't life starting now? This is a question. I mean, if it started back then, what were the conditions back then that were different from the conditions now? Why couldn't it be starting now? Well, Darwin himself answered this question, and I think his answer is probably still correct. He said, it is often said that all the conditions for the first production of a living organism are now present, which could ever have been present. But if, and oh, what a big if. We could conceive in some warm little pond with all sorts of ammonia and phosphoric salts, light, heat, electricity, etc., present, that a protein compound was chemically formed, ready, ready to undergo still more complex changes. At the present day, such matter would be instantly absorbed, eaten, which would not have been the case before living creatures were found. So I call this the Steve Jobs. I mean, you, you can't invent the laptop computer more than once. If you invent it again today, you just, poof, you can't compete. So we do know some things about the origin of life on Earth. It happened about four billion years ago. There was no oxygen, no people, no animals, no plants, no fungi, no eukaryotes of any kind. The first life forms were based in water and they did not breathe oxygen and they got their carbon from CO2.